Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our D6 Sunday School lesson this week. I uh, trust you've had a great week. And I'm going to jump right into uh, the lesson today because we're dealing with the subject of does the Big Bang uh, Theory fit uh, with the truth of the Bible? Does it fit what we see in the Bible about our existence, the, the creation, and it, this is a, a huge topic over the next four weeks. And I want you to go ahead uh, and realize now that there's no way we can cover this all in 30 or 40 minutes or even four weeks. So we're going to be putting some things into your hands, uh, not only through our um, daily devotions that we'll be doing Monday through Friday, but also uh, some resources that you can go to online and be looking at some things while you're there at home and some great things that you can even show uh, your children watch as a family and and I hope that there'll be a lot of discussion about this. You know I heard um, some people in the Creation uh, Institute for Creation uh, Research years ago say that they felt like one of the reasons that many of our younger generation 18, 25 year olds and I know eventually, you know, that, that started being talked about several years ago, but that age group many times leaves the church is not because we have not grounded them in the New Testament teachings, but one of the things that we have failed to do in discipleship is ground them in the beginnings. Um, and Genesis is a book of beginnings. It's very, very important that we teach our children uh, starting at Genesis 1-1, and we'll discuss that a little bit today, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is their foundation for everything that they will believe. And so we're going to talk over the next four weeks and uh, about this subject. And of course, today's lesson is entitled, Where It All Began. I hope that you got, either through the D6 app or through uh, the email that I sent you, the handouts, I hope that you will use them as a tool to do some more digging and also follow along with the lesson. But I want to start um, the lesson today by simply uh, reading a scenario to you and then asking you a couple of questions that I want you to think about. Uh, imagine you're walking down the beach. That's a, that's a thing you can imagine living in this area uh, or if you live in a beach area. Um, and imagine you're walking down the beach and as you're walking, you come upon a message written in the sand that says this, Sally was here. Sally was here. Now, when you think about that little scenario there, I, I want you to ask this question and maybe you can talk about it as a family uh, there together. What are some possible explanations for how that message got there? Uh, when you, when, if imagine you go up and you see that those three words, Sally was here. Um, what would you think? You know, how did that get there? Well, here here is some explanations that you possibly could come up with. A person named Sally wrote it. That's that's probably the simplest. Uh, someone else not named Sally wrote it. Maybe she was with a friend, maybe her parents, uh, may, maybe a sibling. Uh, a dog named Sally used a stick to write the message. Now, that'd be pretty silly, but that's a possibility. Um, that, that would be something that some would, would think would, could happen. The crashing waves formed the message over thousands of years. And you can go on and on and on with the possibilities. But what is the most probable explanation for how that message got there? How, what, I mean, and, and here, here is the most probable explanation. Someone probably named Sally was there at some point and decided to write the message in the sand. That's the most probable. Now, in thinking about that and, and all of those possibilities, let me ask you another question. Can two opposing truth claims ever both be correct at the same time? Now think about this. Could a person named Sally write that message and a dog with a stick write that same message at the same time 
but yet there only be one message? The answer is no. Two uh, opposing truths, even though one of those examples was certainly not true. We know in, in real life, not imaginary life, but we know in real life that a dog's not going to take a stick and write, Sally was here. But two opposing truths, truth claims, cannot be correct at the same time. Why? Well, it's impossible for two opposing claims to be correct. In fact, Two opposing claims can be incorrect, but cannot both be correct. And in relation to the origin of the universe, can the theory of evolution or naturalism and creation both be totally correct at the same time? And if they can't be, why? So here is what we want to really jump in today and look at. I think we all know we live in an awesome, complex world and universe, but how did it get here? Uh, today, we're going to see how the Creator God is the best explanation for the universe rather than a naturalistic Big Bang theory. In fact, we're not just going to see that today. We're going to be looking at that for a few weeks, and I hope that you will really pour your heart into this. It is interesting. It helps us defend our faith. It grounds our young people, our children. In fact, I would say to you, if I were going to disciple my children uh, again, I would start in the book of Genesis. And I want to encourage you. And if you, don't, if you need some more help with that, please let me know. And I will show you and help you know exactly how to do that. Because if we can get them to believe and, and solidify in their hearts and minds as young people, as little people, that God created the heavens and the earth and that, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth is true, then we have a great chance of them embracing the rest of Scripture that simply unveils His plan uh, that ultimately leads to our redemption. And so here's our objectives today. First of all, we want to know that the naturalistic view, the Big Bang, does not fit uh, with with the scriptures, with, with the scriptures that we believe are the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. But we also want to understand that faith in the biblical account of creation best fits with what we see around us. And then we want to stand strong. What do we how do we put this into action? Well, we want to stand strong in the faith, knowing the creator God of the Bible is the best explanation for what we see around us. And so we're going to look at that uh, as we uh, see this, um, this where it all began and, and consider where everything began. So I want you to take your outline, take your Bibles, and uh, obviously the first place and the best place to start is in the beginning, Genesis, the book of beginnings. And in Genesis 1-1, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what we, what, what we want to uh, point out here is that the naturalistic view of the Big Bang does not fit Scripture, nor does it truly explain where matter ultimately came from. Now, one thing that's important to know uh, as we begin in the meat of this lesson is that you need to understand that secular scientists and physicists hold to various theories of the origin of the universe. In fact, most hold to some version of the Big Bang uh, cosmology or theory. Uh, even their views and theories on the Big Bang are constantly changing. For example, Stephen Hawking's final theory on the origin of the universe was different from his earlier theories. Uh, there was a window of time when the belief in a possible eternal universe grew in, in popularity, but few uh, scholars still hold to that hypothesis uh, today. Uh, some leading scientists, both Christian and non-Christian, uh, believe that time and space and matter began to exist at the moment of the Big Bang, which they would consider to be the universe's inception. We just believe that doesn't fit with the whole of Scripture. Uh, others believe that matter somehow already existed uh, in a singularity or cosmic egg and that the Big Bang uh, served to arrange the matter that was already there. And of course, these theories are constantly changing. And normally, because there is evidence 
um, that does not support. And so they began to um, they began to change this, uh, and they began to to rearrange what they uh, what they believe. And so I, I want us to consider the theory that everything came into existence at the moment of the Big Bang, including time, space, and matter. Well, if if time and space and matter did not exist before the Big Bang, then it is logical, logical to conclude that the cause of the universe had to be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial. That is, it's, it, it's an important clarification in relation to you know, the naturalistic uh, Big Bang cosmology or Big Bang theory. Um, they claim that billions of years ago, subatomic particles became concentrated to a single point and exploded. Now here's the question. Where did those subatomic particles come from? If, if they already existed in some form of singularity or this cosmic egg that, that blew up, where did that come from? Uh, the next question would be, where did, those, uh, where did uh, the thing that, that made the subatomic particles come from? And these questions will continue for the rest of time. You, 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 when you start asking those questions, you can just keep asking questions because what we understand is the, the realization that every human must come to is that something or someone eternal had to exist in order for life as we know it to exist. Um, something or someone outside of time, space, and matter had to initiate the beginning of it all. Something or someone had to be the cause. And that's extremely important when you are defending creation or when you're explaining uh, the creation according to the Genesis account. There had to be a cause. And it leads us to the cosmological argument for God, also known as the first cause argument. You see, at its core, Cosmological argument for God states that anything that begins to exist has a cause. Anything that begins to exist has a cause. You see, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe had a cause. And that cause was God. God being eternal did not begin to exist. Therefore he does not have a cause. He does not have a cause because he is eternal. We believe in the eternality of God. And so the, the Genesis 1-1 verse that we read tells us that in the beginning, God, the one who has always existed, he did not have a beginning, he did not have a cause, he created the heavens and the earth. You see, God is spirit, which would correspond with the first cause being spaceless and immaterial. The very first statement in the Bible provides the foundation for making sense of how everything started. In the beginning, God. So how do we apply that? Um, well, we need to stand strong in faith, believing a creator God is the best explanation for the existence of time, space, and matter. You see, it's important to acknowledge that everything that exists had a beginning and a beginner, including time, space, and matter. It seems obvious and intuitive, but it is not always acknowledged within the culture we live in today. We can be confident in living out and sharing our faith, knowing that it makes perfect sense that God is the creator and the beginner and the sustainer of all things. As I've told my 11th and 12th grade um, apologetics class over the last few weeks, we do not live uh, by blind faith. Yes, we do live by faith, and we're going to talk about that. Faith is an element in believing the, the Genesis account of creation. But we don't live, we, we have a rational faith. We have uh, an evidential faith. We have an experiential faith. Uh, you know, there are things that we experience that exist. There are all kinds of things that we uh, 
uh, cause us not to have to live blindly, even though there are things that we believe in that we cannot see. And that's important to understand. So we may ask this question, why is the first cause argument important for understanding the universe's inception? And here's, here's what we need to see about this. The naturalistic view of the Big Bang cannot be possible if there are no subatomic particles yet in existence to concentrate and to explode. You can't, you, if they don't exist, they can't explode. And so it also means that whatever caused the universe to be timeless, spaceless, and immaterial, uh, like God, existed. And that's how um, we come to believe that God is the best possible answer, is because he did exist. He did not have a cause. He is immaterial, and he is timeless and spaceless. And so that's why it's so important that we understand uh, why the the first cause argument is important. But also, what are some simple examples of the first cause argument in everyday experiences? Well, your home, your car, your phone, uh, your very, uh, when, when you very, uh, the beginning of your existence, uh, something caused your existence. And, and so th those are some examples of the first cause argument. But then I want us to turn our attention to Hebrews 11 and look at the first three verses. And, and this is what we're going to uh, see in this, is that all theories about the origin of the universe require faith. I, I don't deny that. People say, well, you got to have faith to believe that. Sure we do. The Bible tells us that the just live by faith. We do live by faith. Um, but we don't live with a blind faith. Uh, and so Hebrews 11 verse 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence or the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of the things that are visible. Now let me read that in, uh, that was the, the ESV. Let me read it uh, in uh, the King James Version, as uh, many of you may be familiar with. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And so the great challenge in our culture today uh, is the belief that faith and science are incompatible with one another. In fact, it, it is considered illogical to believe that science is true and also believe in religion. Uh, many attempts have been made to marry naturalistic science and faith in a way that could provide a happy balance, but we need to realize that regardless of what term culture may use to refer to the beginning of the universe, it will still point to the reality that something or someone powerful started it all. You see, the words Big Bang bring different things uh, to, to mind for different people. Some believe when they hear Big Bang, that's the origin of the universe, uh, as described from a naturalistic um, perspective. Uh, for those who hold a creationist perspective, those words generally ref reflect a position that does not acknowledge a creator God. And for others, those words are neutral and simply refer to how everything got started. But one of the things we do know about when you hear Big Bang is that somewhere you have to either deny the existence of God or deny that he had anything to do with it uh, or just somehow marry the two that really does not match up and fit within the framework of Scripture. And so uh, regardless of the feelings, the reality is that the concept of everything bursting into ex existence is actually evidence for a supernatural creator. 
Christian apologist Sean McDowell said it well. He said, I don't reject the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. Therefore, the Big Bang term alone should not cause believers to grow anxious because believers can point to the Creator who spoke everything into being. In fact, it is the implication behind the Big Bang term with mainstream science that we must be careful not to adopt. Now, um, I, I don't. I would not state that the same way. Uh, I believe the Genesis account of Scripture, and um, you know, Sean McDowell says he just knows who who, who put out the Big Bang, and so uh, I just believe that God spoke this into existence as He said, um, and I, I know that that's a real simple explanation for such a big topic, but I want to. Um, assure you that we will dig deeper as we go along in these next few weeks to come. Hebrews 11 is known as a faith chapter. And one of the things in this chapter we can, we can walk away with is that we can be confident and assured in what we hope for, even if we cannot see it. Uh, It implies having a faith that is reasonable and founded on real evidences and experiences. And so, in in fact, verse 3 reminds us that we can understand that the universe was created at the command of its creator. It says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. And so we, we need to understand that. I want to give you a, real quick, and I'll I'll put it in your email, but I want to give it to you here just in case you don't have it. There is a brief overview, uh, video overview that you can look at, and it's simply at this website, uh, bit.ly slash icr big bang, icr big bang bit.ly icr big bang and um uh and so uh, i want and and put the slash after the ly i'm sorry i left it out the second time and so you need to understand that theistic evolution is increasingly popular uh with christian universities and christian context um and and there'll be another uh video link that i will give you uh, that will help provide you with more clarity on what theistic evolution is, uh, as well as the dangers of adopting it as plausible. And so uh, I, I, I will give that to you in the email as well, or you can get it in the D6 app uh, under your lesson. And so how do we, if we're going to admit that we do live by faith, um, if we're going to admit um that there is a there is a element of faith, a huge element of faith, as we live, uh, the just live by faith in believing that God spoke the world into existence. Then how do, how do we apply that to our life? What's the application uh, there? Well, we simply stand strong in biblical faith, knowing that faith is required in every human being's worldview, regardless of what they claim to believe. When somebody says, "Well, you got to have a lot of faith to believe that." You can just simply turn around to them and say, well, you have to have a lot of faith to believe what you believe. In fact, I'm convinced that some of these theories of the origins of the universe require a whole lot more faith than what ours does. We have far more evidence and and good, solid, uh, foundational explanation than many of the the theories and the the ideas uh, about the origins of the universe. So why do all positions of the origin of the universe require faith? Uh, Because no one except God was there to document what happened. Uh, That's why. That's an easy answer. Uh, God was the only one there. There was no one else. And so it does take faith to believe that God, and and Hebrews 11, uh, or Hebrews um, 11.3 tells us that it's by faith that we believe that. And then what are some reasons by faith why believers can be confident in the Genesis account of creation. Well, it best matches what we see around us. Um, 
you know, when you think about all the elements of, just go back and read the creation story and then just look around. You see the things that Genesis talks about. Um, evidence and fulfilled prophecy have, have proven over and over the Bible to be reliable. You know, if, if the Bible is reliable in many of the things that, that evidence has pointed to, then there, there's a good reason that we can believe Genesis 1-1. Um, and the order and the design of creation point to an intelligent designer. Um, this just does not all exist uh, in, in my, uh, my worldview by chance. Uh, there had to be an intelligent designer, and uh, we believe that is the Almighty God. And, and then I want us to, to look at Romans, uh, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 1, and, and it's one of my favorite chapters, and I, I point to it a lot for several reasons. Uh, but we're going to look at Romans 1, and we're going to also look over in the Psalms. But the third thing we want to uh, see is that the order and design of the universe do not fit an accidental, naturalistic Big Bang. The order and design of the universe do not fit an accidental, naturalistic Big Bang. In Romans 1, starting in verse 18, this is what the scripture says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I think you need to look at that word suppress. We need to understand that the problem with people, when God turns them over for, to a reprobate mind, to and they become, uh, they start living the characteristics of the rest of this passage that you'll see uh, starting in uh, verse 21 and on down when they became futile in their thoughts. That was not because they didn't have the truth presented to them or did not have an opportunity to know the truth. They suppressed the truth. And, and that's what that's what the scripture is saying him, uh, who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, and listen, so that they are without excuse. God has put it in us. Uh, he has shown us through creation. He's manifested his invisible attributes in us. We are made in his image. And so the order and design of the universe do not fit this accidental naturalistic Big Bang uh, explanation. And so, uh, you know, we also look at, uh, at back in the book of Psalms, and we, we see in Psalm 19, and, and verse 1, the scripture says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament show his handiwork. And, and so that's extremely important for us to understand, is that God is telling us that the very universe that he created uh, and the things that are in it point to him. And, and so uh, those are some of the evidences that we have. And then we want to end up today in um, in Psalm 148, and we may just close uh, by reading that uh, in just a, a, a little bit. So what we really ask ourselves today is which views, which view of origins is probable? We've established that each require faith, but it is the evidential data corresponding with the real world that really helps us determine which belief is more probable. Um, Big Bang cosmology um, posits the belief that the beginning universe was essentially a cosmic accident. You know, when I look around, when I think about um, we're all rejoicing over the birth of Hayden, uh, Huff, uh, Pastor Jeremy and Miss Rebecca's little boy, um, I just don't believe that's an accident. Uh, when we look at, that, at, at babies being born, when we look at, at, at even animals, the animal world, the, the planet world, the, the, um, the plant world, the vegetation world, it's just not by accident. When we look at how the, the, the earth is, is designed and the heavens are designed, it's just not reasonable to think that it was an accident. 
Um, but the, many of these beliefs believe, uh, this Big Bang uh, theory especially, that it was essentially a cosmic accident and greatly dependent on the element of chance. Uh, the belief certainly requires faith, as creation does. We have to be fair in our defense and explanation. Um, but this other idea of the, the beginning of the, the origins of the universe doesn't seem to match up with our actual experiences in reality. Think about it again, the example we used. Vehicles, buildings, cell phones, our homes, bridges, planes, military ships, houses, churches, books, have an architect, so many more things, have an ar architect or a cause. And so anytime we see any of these things in the real world, we intuitively understand a designer was at work. And Romans 1, 18 through 20, remind us that we have an eternal uh, God who is our designer. Every aspect of creation that we have had the privilege of observing or testing or discovering proclaims the evidence of a designer. And all of it is set in its proper place. Think about this. Let me give you two or three examples. Did you know the sun and moon are perfectly positioned, operating as they were created to operate, providing the necessary amount of light and warmth for the rest of life to exist? Chance cannot account for that. Think about the planet Jupiter. Jupiter is perfectly positioned within our solar system to guard the Earth from the insurmountable amount of meteor showers and space debris that would inevitably hit our planet if it weren't for the positioning and size of that massive planet protector. You want to leave that to chance? I don't think so. How about the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere? It is precise, allowing life to exist and thrive. Too little oxygen, we couldn't exist. We could not survive. Too much oxygen in our air would, would be too combustible and it would be hazardous uh, for life. Want to give that to chance? Not a chance. You see, the orderliness and structure of our universe offers incredible evidence that it has all been purposefully designed and aligned with that description found in Genesis 1 and 2. I believe that is God. So how do we apply this? Well, we stand strong in faith, seeing the universe display um, the power, the order, and creativity of God. We, we stand strong in our faith, but acknowledging that the universe displays the power and the order and the creativity of God. You see, God alone is worthy to be praised. And Psalm 148 is a great reminder that God is worthy and glorified above all. All of his creation shouts his praises. All of his creation uh, acknowledges the skillfulness of his fashioning hands from the highest heaven.